We are shows what you know. We'll always watch TV. And if you think we can't, we'll watch more and you'll see. That's why the people of the web believe in Jim from Las Vegas and Jacob from Sweden. Welcome to uh, Gilead Gazette. Extra, extra indeed. We are here to discuss Handmaid's Tale Season 2, Episode 3, and also to fulfill all your needs for government-approved, Gilead-sponsored information across the board for you to read on your commute on those nice, uh, desaturated trains we got running all over the place to get you to your eco-work, where you do your eco-labor uh, for your eco-wives and eco-husbands and all your little families out there. Though most of you probably don't have kids. That's how it goes. Who knows? My name is Jacob Burrows. And I am Jim Scampoli, and that's right, we are here to discuss and break down The Handmaid's Tale, and I mean, I've got revelations, I've got questions here, hmm. now that we're in episode three of season two, titled Baggage, uh, I don't know who wrote this episode, someone hmm. wrote it. Someone uh, did write it, indeed. Um, before we get into the revelations, uh, I did want to mention something I probably should have mentioned earlier. Um, we got, but I didn't know about it. I guess it's not a big deal or nothing, but I am Swedish for those listening, so I will be safe when Gilead finally happens, at least for a little bit. Um, but it, it was at the premiere of season two, they had a sort of guerrilla campaign showing off, uh, so, you know, t introducing some people to the show by having literal handmaids walk around Stockholm. They were dressed up in the red cloaks with the white wings and everything. Maybe this happens all the time over in America, but here it's like exciting. It's going to make the news. Uh, if you're on the video feed, I'm showing you now some pictures of them walking around the st subway of Stockholm, uh, just in their regular Handmaid's Tale type outfits. Uh, what do you think, Jim? I mean, I think it's pretty cool. Uh, the The danger with some of that with a show like this, it's like, I mean, it's one thing if you're going to have like Infinity War comes out and you have, I mean, of course, Thor walking around and Captain America or whatever. Yeah. But, you know, this show obviously deals with some uh, heavy themes, heavy topics, and then also it's trying to tie into real world issues you know when does it become exploitive and advert like viral marketing over like uh, a message or you know is it too intertwined because it is a tv show it's so inherently political that when i heard there were people walking around with handmaid's tales outfit i didn't think it was for the show i thought it was a political statement about something about society and the things they were handing out were going to be something about something political but no it was just hey watch this show man it's a good show and i mean they're not wrong it is a good show but it is interesting it's almost like you're being reminded like oh yeah no yeah hbo uh it's capitalist it's like we need to earn money and sell subscriptions to hbo nordic um and so on that's the whole goal here we have to keep that in mind and remember that yeah, like your revolution is co-opted. Uh, it is written by Dorothy Fortenberry and directed by Carrie Skogland, which I assume is a Swedish person, but maybe not. Actually, I checked it out. I think she's a Canadian director, actually. Uh, and she's done like one episode of a bunch of different shows. Uh, but I, I, I did check it out literally because I was like, another Swede. But then, no. Uh, it's probably got some heritage, though. We'll claim her. I'll, I'll, ta I'll take it. Well, I mean, because like I was saying here is uh, this episode does open up. We're opening up the world more. I mean, and, and naturally the show's doing that as well because they're in somewhat uncharted territory uh, because season one ended where the book ended. But I guess this thing of econo uh, families or econo wives is something touched upon in the book, but nothing we've seen previously, at least that I remember from season one. I mean, yeah, I would suppose so because... We've been in the, you know, the noble families. They're the only ones who have the handmaids and so on. But the thing that I I did not know this, and maybe it's just some dumb and I missed it in season one. June is a handmaid because she married, she, she, she slept with a married man and then he divorced his wife and married her. How did I not know this? Do you know this? No, I mean, I maybe, kind of. But that's, are you referring to the fact that people might be fertile without being handmaids? 
Yes, because I was under the impression that the main reason why she was taken as a handmaid was because it was mostly because she was a, a fertile woman. Same but here. Now I'm getting the impression, at least from what I'm reading, that there are Econo wives that do serve. They're just the poor version of, uh, you know, the what we've seen because they serve all three roles. They serve the role of the um, with the handmaid. And then you have what was Martha? The, Martha, yes, correct. The handmaid, the Martha, and the wife, basically. The Holy Trinity. Yes. So there that's what the Econo wives are. And I mean, June does make the, there is a line in this episode where she says, you know, if if I didn't she uh cheat or like cheat with my husband. But I, I read that as like when I first heard it, I was thinking like, oh, she cheated on her husband. But then I had to look at it and I was like, oh no she slept with a married man and then that's who became her husband. And then they had a child. But I guess when Gilead took over, they like went through the records with a fine tooth comb and they're like, wait a minute, eight years ago, you cheated on your wife and married your mistress. So that's why she was going to be taken away. Well, you tell me if you had the same reaction I did to something in this episode, where when he, she comes into this apartment and sees a child, you're like, oh shit, this child probably lives a secluded life. He has to hide in this apartment all the time because no one can know that the wife is fertile. And the reason that the wife is scared that there's a handmaid is, is they're going to find out that she's fertile and then she's going to become a handmaid. That was my reaction. What about you? Um, yeah, I mean, I guess a little of that. I, I maybe just assumed that... Um... She was now infertile, but she had had a child beforehand. Although I guess given that the child's not that old, but um, yeah, I mean, June has somewhat of a young child as well. So yeah, I guess I was just kind of completely confused. Like I thought things, I mean, obviously things are so bleak in this show. They're very bleak, but I thought they were like to the point. I mean, we're, we're seeing that they're talking about trading handmaids with Mexico. In yeah. One, but now it's like, they kind of have econo wives, but I guess they keep them in line with like, if you step out of line, you're be going to become a handmaid. And I mean, that's obviously a nightmare. Uh, but yeah, I just stuff, I guess I was like, how did I not know this? How did I not realize like some of the rules of this world? I just assumed much like in the, the previous episode when um, off Glenn or what's her non-slave name, uh, Emily was mm -hmm. being questioned at the airport and they keep saying like, you know, did you have your child naturally? Did you have your child naturally? And I, but I guess she does have the added uh, crime quote. And I'm not saying it's a crime. The added crime of being gay and being fertile. So I guess that does make sense on why she was shoved into the handmaid uh, role. And I guess what we know about the one eyed um, handmaid is what she was kind of like a junkie beforehand. So maybe that's also why I, I guess I didn't realize that the handmaids had these indiscretions. Uh, I'm doing hand quotes here that kind of put them in that role. Yeah, me neither. Absolutely. And uh, I mean, maybe we're idiots, as you said, but I think it's everyone probably had the same reaction because I think the show has communicated uh, that if you're fertile, we make you a handmaid. And I had the impression that it's like that it's children of men, that there are no babies, more, more or less. And I mean, otherwise, it's a hell of a coincidence that all the wives of all the fucking commanders are all infertile and they all need handmaids. But just there are just women running around who are like, no, of course, she can't be a wife of a commander, but uh, she's totally fertile. But she can't be a handmaid because she hasn't done anything bad yet. And uh I don't know. Uh, maybe it's just that, you know, there's not an infinity amount of commanders. You just need one handmaid per commander, uh, I guess, right? That makes yeah, it make that's sense. That's what it seems like, unless they, you know, have to ship them out to the colonies because they ran someone over, then they bring a new one in, or if they want to get a few to send over to Mexico or what have you. But, but I mean, it, it does, it, well, go ahead. I was just going to say, it does make them seem less valuable, like maybe they could have snapped some necks in episode one then if they had some people to call up because, hey, you committed the crime of going to church not often enough or whatever. There's all, You can always grab an Econo wife. They're almost unwomen uh, as far as ranking systems go uh, in this weird society. So uh, it, it's it's kind of weird, and it was very strange to see a child because I recall how, you know... When there's a child, oh my god, we ring all the bells and we fucking do have a little party and the Mexican ambassador is so amazed when children come in. And then it's just like, no, we just got children out here in the suburbs or, the you know, we just, we just have the children all over.
But yeah. I guess not all over, but it was just weird that the first time we see one of these families, it's like, no, of course there's a kid here. Yeah, I mean, I guess it's, you know, something they have to do. They have to kind of open up and spread this world out a bit. But uh, yeah, I was just surprised I kind of missed it. And I mean, yeah, season one does, it is just focused mostly on uh, June and her story. And we're kind of slowly introduced to this world. And I, I was with you. I kind of thought it was a children of men scenario where uh, basically like it was almost like impossible um, to to have children. I mean, not that any of this rationalization like makes sense as far as for what Gilead's doing. I'm not trying to be like, oh, this isn't so bad then. Uh, they they broke the law. Uh, I just it's just interesting because I'm this deep into the show, and I guess I kind of miss some of that stuff. Um, I guess some of it's more fleshed out a bit more in the book. Like, I guess part of the reason why they didn't run immediately, at least in the book is uh they just kind of thought they were safe until they realized they were going through and would find out that you know their marriage was the result of uh infidelity and that was going to become an issue so that's why uh june's husband decided to you know try to get his family and get the hell out of there but of course we know that didn't really work yeah it is weird because it is um it is children of men we know it is but it's not as it's like how many percent children of men is it then and i mean obviously the commanders and their wives are the one percent i guess most people are just doing this weird farming going back to the old roots of society type thing but how much like how many of them are fertile i know I like I don't need to sh the show to like have another slideshow with Aunt Lydia talking about percentages and things, but it just it, it threw me off a lot when there was suddenly a kid, because they took like they took her daughter away and put her in like a weird home to raise the children as like the upper class or whatever. But this child is not in the upper class. Uh, it's just hanging out and gonna be a an eye or whatever, which seems like a waste if you just have a few kids. Well, uh, N Natasha in the chat saying, you know, it's why they took away Hannah instead of letting them keep her. They're considered unfit. unfit. But I thought they took her away because she tried to leave. Like my my whole read all the time was they were leaving because they were going to make June. They were going to take her kid away and make June a handmaid. So they were like, let's get the fuck out of here. Uh, because I just remember they took her away because they were running. I don't remember it being like you're an adulterer. I mean, I guess I do remember that on Lydia called her like an adulterer or whatever, but yes. I didn't know that was kind of a catalyst. I assumed yeah. the catalyst was more that they found out that she was still a uh, fertile woman. Yeah. And Natasha is right that, you know, they're, they're called adulterers or gender traitors or whatever in like when they're trained. But I thought that was like, no, Gilead considers everyone a sinner, like literally everyone. And now you're going to repent. But I guess, yeah, I, I guess they're there because of specifics. Um, I do. I can't help but wonder about like numbers and things since it is kind of the basis of the whole society and the whole conceit. Um, and I wonder how many children there are running around in Canada and uh, so on and so forth. Um, because, I mean, the whole thing is like we need to get children for the 1%. Like clearly there are people capable of getting children everywhere. But then in Mexico, it's like, well, they can have children. So yeah. I don't even know. Yeah, that's true. Uh, but either way, I mean getting into this episode specifically like i guess i i did hear that uh the viewership has like doubled from uh mm -hmm. season one to season two kind of going back to what we talked about uh last week talking about how it feels like this show is kind of uh gonna blow up and get pop more popular but then i realized like watching the show like there's definitely it feels like there's a ceiling because this show's like heavy uh mm -hmm. obviously yeah. and it's a lot of dread and a lot of you know uh, depression. Uh, but I mean, we pick up this because I mean, a lot of this episode is kind of wondering, running and wondering and waiting and hoping for the best and realizing you have to, you know, take oh. control. Uh, but we start out with, you know, kind of uh, June has a routine at the Boston Globe. And it's interesting because it feels like maybe this is going to be a running thing for this season because she's kind of going through people's stories and stuff. Like, cause I mean, she's at a, a newspaper headquarters, so she's kind of like much, much like we are. <clears throat> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I assume like, uh Oh, are we, just, are we going to use this as a vehicle to kind of tell other people's stories? Like, is June going to take more of a back seat? 
I totally expected it, but you know, that's clearly not where they go, really. <laughs> yeah, because the next scene is like time to go. I yeah. mean, I did like that she's building her own sort of conspiracy wall, uh, much like I have on my wall for Westworld, trying to piece that together. She's sort of seeing the traces of how society got to where it is, which uh is, you know, connecting the future even more with the the present or the past or what have you. And she has these different headlines on the wall of like uh, marginalization, power structure, curtailing of civil rights, um, and all these things that we are kind of concerned about uh, right now. Yeah, and I mean, we don't have to go scene by scene, um, but kind of talking in generals here. Like, one thing I really worry about this show is because it's already, um, it's it's already, as we said, it's already pretty heavy, and it's not really, it's not like the show's subtle. Uh, yeah. And with what it's doing, it really shouldn't be. But when we start to get into some other things, I feel like they 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 start to maybe run run the line a little too close. Um, like maybe this is in the book, I don't know. But we we learn a bit about June's mother in this episode, and it's like, so of course June's mother is some radical like protester feminist lady. Like it felt a little too you know, June is refusing the call that her mother's trying to give her proper advice on how to be a hero like her. And yeah. now she's learning that what she should have done all along, like it felt a little, uh, it felt a little too on the nose to me personally. Yeah, that's fair. I mean, and also for someone who preaches free will and autonomy and do what you will, she sure has a lot of judgment for her own daughter, for someone not following the path that she herself values um and i mean i mean it's heavy-handed but at the same time it does a fairly good job of making you dislike the way she's acting and then you find out oh no don't worry she got sent to the labor camps to die and it's like well, oh yeah okay <laughs> the other thing too and again it's a tv show you have to take some you know liberties but like she just so happens to be the one that's in the film strip of the la like Ah, it's just some of that stuff. It gets too like, all right. And then when she looks at the, this is uh, different, but it's in the same vein when she's in the, um, like the airport hangar and she sees the sign for Salem. I'm rolling my eyes. My eyes are falling out of my head because you don't, this show doesn't need to do that. We get it. Yeah. Salem, witch trials, right? Here we are again. History repeats itself, man, dude. Uh, but is it is it called New Salem now or something like that? I seem to recall like the city. No, I thought it was just the sign for Salem. It's the regular street sign you would see, right. like like now entering Salem, like that they just took. Because I also shout out. I mean, because I'm I grew up in Massachusetts. I did shout out the Route Three Cape Cod uh, air, um, highway sign. I've seen that sign. I've driven on Route Three. I was like, hell yeah, thumbs up. But okay. they no, it's just purposeful. Like Salem is the one on top, so we can look at it and be like, hmm. Uh, burning women who had different ideas uh, i yeah and then it's like are you a good witch or a bad witch i yeah. actually reacted more to her like stroking the boston sign which was only which i'm sure you do every time you get back to boston but yeah. only because she just spent two months in like the boston globe and looked at the word boston every day running past it on the fucking thing so it's kind of like maybe do that after you see the Salem sign or whatever, because it's not that weird to see a traffic sign with Boston. You were just in a place that had that all over it, being reminded of the past. If this was the first place you were brought to, then it would be like, whoa, it's like pieces of the old world. But you've been studying the old world for two months, so I'm not sure where that came from. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's a very, just... very minor thing for me to complain about, but I still. Mean, yeah, don't get me wrong. These are nitpicks, but that's when I start to second... Like, because... There's a lot of stuff. Uh, I, I feel like this show's very well done, and I have a lot of respect for how they do it and how they juggle tones and like have it. I mean, obviously it's a bleak show, but you have to keep the audience, you know, involved. And sometimes the show's weirdly playful with the music and some of the filmmaking techniques. So I have a lot of faith with the people that do it. But then when they kind of are like, "Hey, you know what else was in Massachusetts? Salem. Remember Salem witch trials." And again, it's such a small thing. I know I'm being a dick about it, but it just, that's what I, I, I have to, I, like, I, like I said, I just roll my eyes. I'm like, all right, we get it. We already understand. We're in Gilead. We get it. Yeah. Okay. That's fair. And I think it's probably uh, some of those things might be from going off book as it were, because 
I, I don't think it's a bad thing. In fact, I've, I've seen, you know, a lot of adaptations that are better or add totally new things to what they're making. And I have hope that it's going to be the same thing here. But at the same time, there's a couple of things uh, come creeping in and it, it might not be an issue at all, but that feel more like TV. Like, and that's not weird. It is a television show. But some of these coincidences, like seeing her mother up on the screen, that's something you write in a TV script because it's visual. You don't write that in a novel. You write about her hearing about it from someone else somehow because you wouldn't need to do it in a novel. But here it's like, no, you got to do it visually. It's a t TV medium. Um, so some of those things, uh, if they pile up, it can get to feel more like, oh, okay, it's just television. But so far, I mean, it, they're doing a good job of it, I think, and I'm hopeful. I agree. I, I'm not trying to take too much away. And I mean, it is, it, it's the best way to get that information across because, yeah, you don't want to just have a flashback to June walking, uh, well, when she's off red walking, and then someone's like, hey, off red, I saw your mother at the colony. You know, yeah. I, I get like they do. They, you got you got to take a liberty. You want to get that information across it, and it's more about how it affects June. So, uh, completely understandable. It's just when I saw a, a few of the things, like you said, it started to add up mostly in this episode, like the Salem sign, the fact that she was kind of a radical. I am seeing in the chat that, I mean, I guess she did work in an abortion clinic, so it, it is kind of par for the course. So it does yeah, make sense. But yeah. I guess maybe it was like. I would understand that she was this, you know, free thinking protester organizing stuff, especially when things are the way they are in Gilead. But they had to also show that she was all about it when she was a little girl as well. And it still does make sense because if she works in an abortion clinic and helps, you know, women that were raped and stuff like it, it does make sense. It just felt so on the nose for June that she was kind of like, seeing it but not fully embracing it and now she's forced to embrace it so it to yeah. me it was like a refusing the call but, but but the other stuff like the fact that she is she still has that mother daughter relationship that we've seen in so much media like kind of the overbearing judgmental mom like i guess i do like that because it's not like she's this hero because she's a um protester on the right side of history she's still uh, like a mom and can still affect June the same way any other mother can. Yeah. And towards the end, she does get to say that she's realized now that we didn't do that bad. Like, sure. We had disagreements, but we did better than most or as good as most. Yeah. Um, and well, so on. I mean, and, and, and to the, like the reason why it's, we don't necessarily have to go scene by scene because a lot of the scenes in this episode are like, they play up the tension really well because we're with June. We don't know, you know, this guy shows up, let's go. Uh Oh, like, do, should I trust this guy? Is this the, the right choice? What do I need to do? And I mean, the clear theme is that time and time again, throughout this episode, she has to take charge. Uh, and not, even though it's men helping her, she has to make the big choice. That's why I also don't like that. I mean, she they have a line like we already saw it in the show, but like the line is like raise your daughter to be a feminist and then she waits to be rescued by men. And again, I feel like they're, they're starting to go too on the nose there because it's like we're, we're seeing that she isn't just waiting to be rescued. So you don't have to say it. I already get it. I already get what's happening. Like she doesn't let that guy leave her there. Uh, yeah. She has to make well, she, first she has to make the choice to just trust the person who's taking her from the Boston globe with like no real information to go on. And then she doesn't let the man leave her in the airport hangar. And she doesn't just wait for them to come back because she's already learned what she's learned. And she makes her, she figures out a way to get to the airfield, but then they have to like say it. Uh, and, that, and then again, it just ties into some of the other like little, little nitpicks I have with some of the other plot points in this episode. Well, yeah, the guy the guy tries to leave her at the place with the signs, and she hits him with the old peepers, the old uh, the old one two up there in her skull, the old doe eyes, and uh, manages to convince uh, him to let her tag along to his home to stick around there because you can't wait here for whatever reason. I guess that you got to be closer to the place so you can get to the place. I mean, I don't know, I have a map of this uh, area, but I guess it adds up. Yeah, I mean, I guess like from they mentioned Worcester. 
Worcester is not close to Boston, really. It's like at least an hour away uh, dr- driving, maybe closer to two, something like okay. that. Uh, okay. But that's but the, like being a, like an idiot nitpicker like that. That's why I'm like, why is she looking at a map of Boston right now, bro? You ain't near Boston. Settle yeah. down. OK, <laughs> well, yeah, as you mentioned, the part where she's in the woods, I guess that's where we start getting a lot of the voiceover when she's getting sort of flashbacks to when she was trying to run away the first time and everything was getting totally messed up. And uh, I didn't even follow everything that she was talking about, if I'm being honest. That she, I mean, the line you said, it's obvious what she's talking about. But I guess the choice she's making is, tell me if I got this right, that she's got to leave her daughter behind. And that's a very difficult thing to do. And that's the same when she gets to the plane later, right? Yes. Yeah, it's that. I mean, obviously, that'd be tough for any parent. But, you know, what we uh, like is obviously even harder for a mother, uh, at least from what our standard roles would be. So it, it, it makes sense. And she's yeah, flashing back to when she tried to get away with her daughter and she couldn't. And now, like, she really has no choice. And like, I kept waiting for her to even when she got in the plane that she's going to be like, stop. And I was like, don't yeah. you dare fucking get out of this plane. I mean, we'll get to what happens and how fucking heartbreaking that is. But, uh, I like, I think they played that up really well and the guilt and that comes along with that. And plus her own relationship with her own mother. Yeah. But she gets a bit poetic, uh, with, with her, with her voiceover when she starts saying there in the woods, she's too young. It's too late. We come apart, my arms are held, uh, and the edges go dark. And I'm kind of like, what are you talking about? And nothing is left but a little window. And I'm like, okay, I guess, but you're showing us, me a very aggressive f- flashback right now. It doesn't line up completely with the poetry. And she talks about a very little window. And I'm like, but I get what you're saying with the visuals already. This voiceover isn't adding, it's distracting me almost. Y- her face is telling me the story, but then it, but then the voiceover is like, like the wrong end of a telescope. And I'm like, yeah, no, I know, I know. Like, and then we get more flashbacks. And, you know, we, we've talked about flashbacks. We discuss a lot of different TV shows. And sometimes they cut it in like, wait, why did you cut to that? But here it makes the most sense because she's having flashbacks to all these things and choosing what to let go. That's the visual component I need and her face. And this is, I, I'm not saying, like, I, I guess it would be worse if the voiceover was like, am I going to really leave my daughter? I don't even know if I should leave my daughter. Like, it would, if it was just stating what's going on but they're doing something different in the voiceover and for me it was almost distracting because i was like wait what's she talking about she left me once and she said what else does she say uh now i have to leave her okay yeah that's a good conclusion to it yeah no yeah i I, i'm with you because that's like what you're talking about that's they're trying to do a little of both there like i I mean i would almost uh, i i would almost wouldn't be surprised if some of that was from the book when her i mean Obviously, we're not yeah. disappointing the book, but maybe when like uh, her daughter was taken. But who knows? Because it definitely sounds like something you'd be reading in the book of the description of how it happened from her point of view. Uh, but yeah, yeah, I, I'm kind of with you. Like they they could have let the the visuals kind of speak for themselves because we get what's going on. We get that she's struggling with that choice as a mother to uh, leave her child behind. As you said, they do a good job of ratcheting up the tension through the episode. It's kind of one thing going through. Uh, And there is a real sense of tension when she finally heads outside in these borrowed clothes because she hasn't been outside for so long. And this is the first time we see her doing that since she got kind of safe, kind of rescued. And we were so on board with her getting rescued and whatever. But now it's like, oh, shit. Also, I had the thought, why does she not tie back her hair or, you know, hide it more in general? Like the other women all have their hair in their thing, June. And you got to have it all loose. What's going on there? Yeah, exactly. Like, the yeah, as the audience, we're trying to pick apart what she maybe messed up or what, like is that is that armed guard uh, side eyeing her? Does he know what's going on? So it really, uh, it was a fantastic job of kind of getting us in her head, and because I'm, I'm sure she's thinking the same things, and it's this danger of being captured. Uh, backing up a little bit, I do like the interactions with the Econo wife, and like, I mean, I guess a lot of it is kind of the self preservation and the brainwashing talking, where like she's judgmental of the handmaids where 
Oh yeah. Like, <laughs> oh, you know, I wouldn't let I wouldn't let that happen to me. Like I wouldn't let someone take my kid. I would die first. And it's so easy. Like I understand where she's coming from and why she would say that, but obviously it's so easy to say and think that. Uh, well, yeah, and the way she says it, I don't know how you could give your baby up to someone else. Yeah. Like it was up to her at all. Does she know what country she's in? Exactly. <laughs> um, very true. I, I do have one unfortunate revelation to make, which is that when I was looking up reviews of The Handmaid's Tale after watching the first two episodes, um, there are some reviewers who get advanced copies of things and they like to talk about that stuff. And the and I, I guess that's fine. But literally the first line in the first review I pulled up was, um, in episode three of The Handmaid's Tale, I made the mistake of thinking something positive was going to happen. That was the first line. So I didn't feel that much tension, actually, because I knew it wasn't going to end well because of that fucking review. That's annoying. It's fine if, like, you discuss specifics in your stupid review because you want to, like, uh, show off that you watch the episodes for everyone yeah. else. But uh, let's give some goddamn spoiler warnings here. Um, so yeah, who, I mean, because who who would get anything out of reading that review? No yeah. one's coming to that. Like, tell me what happens in the later episodes. I just want to get a, a sense of what critics are saying about it, and like what what the general thought on it is. Not telling me what happens later because maybe you think you're being vague, but you're clearly not being vague because the first three episodes are all about her escaping and this plan coming together and build like it all. This episode is building up this tension to this one point, and at the end, yeah. The, you might be able to make the mistake of thinking she's getting away on that plane, but uh, yeah, I kind of knew it. Uh, knew she wasn't because uh, of that fucking line, and that's why we give the guarantee that we're never going to talk about episodes that have not been aired yet. Not at all because we don't have them. It's because we don't want to spoil you. Yes, we respect the audience. Exactly. Uh, well, I mean, before we get a little bit more into that that uh, airplane escape, um, we do check in with Moira and luke uh and i don't know who their roommate's name is like their other person they're with now they're talking a bit about like the border security beefing up and they mentioned something about invasion now do they mean like that canada is going to go in and kick some ass and and make things right again or they're talking about like gilead might be like we're going to go into canada and take all these fertile people like what i, I couldn't really glean what they were getting at well, if we were historians, we would, because they do give, like, a specific thing of, like, just like in 1775 or something. And I know at some point the Canadians went down and burned the White House or whatever. So maybe that's what they're referring to, which would let us know which direction they're talking about, north or south. But Well, I mean, I'm 1776 was our uh, American Revolution. That was when we were, like, we're the best. That's why uh, uh, Alex Jones always talks about the spirit of 1776. <laughs> well, I'm so glad you're here to give me this insight, Jim, that all our listeners uh, desperately I'm not need. a fan of Alex Jones, by the way. That's a goof. Yeah, uh, it's important to mention that. Um, but I need, I'm trying to find the exact thing, because I just pulled that year out of my ass, so we don't really know. Um, I was also wondering that, though. I was like, wait, which direction? Because they're talking about the British and Canadian uh, army running along there. I'm trying to find it. Yeah, because I mean, 1776, 1776, anyways, is yeah the Declaration of Independence, uh, right? But I probably just said that line because I listened to the Hamilton soundtrack a bunch, and they sing that over and over. <laughs> uh, so that's probably not in The Handmaid's Tale. I mean, you're pulling references from Hamilton. I'm pulling Infowars <laughs> references. What a great show we have. Yeah, I agree. Uh, there's very little stuff with uh, Luke and, and Moira in this episode, actually, but uh, it is nice to see. As you said, their their roommate. I don't, I don't know what uh, their role is in the show. I mean, they've definitely not been in it before, as far as I remember. And, and I, my guess is that they're refugees, so they get oh. some sort of assistance with getting this housing. So she's yeah. another refugee, I would assume. Yes, yeah. I mean, blessed be the Fruit Loops, and that's like a funny line. Um, we see Moira kind of trying to help uh like a new refugee and kind of get them acclimated to not being in gilead anymore and what he was basically like a guard or something that would have to murder people and uh you know has to deal with that and moira is still also like at first i wasn't sure if it was a flashback or something like when she's in the club but i mm -hmm. that is basically present day and 
she does use her uh like hooker prostitute name that she had in gilead what was it um ruby ruby yes yeah she becomes ruby when she you know has a has a fling in the bathroom at the club i mean obviously just trying to deal with uh all the trauma and uh everyday life of what's going on uh from gilead yes but she can't allow this uh this woman to reciprocate as it were probably because of the extreme trauma she's gone through um and which is i mean i it was weird for me even just to see her in a club basically considering yeah. that she has been you know stuck in a brothel and then she goes to a place that's not exactly the same but it has a, a similar kind of vibe and i almost see it as defiance against like i'm not gonna let that experience shape who i am now i want to do what i did before and enjoy that uh but she can't at least not completely yes and um now, okay, so sorry, I just found it where they say that it's like they're going to go down through upstate New York. And if they're going down, I guess it's an invasion okay. down. But they do say it's 1775 all over again. So I guess when the British came in in 75, maybe. Well, I don't know if that's when that happens. Could be. Could be. Who knows? Invasion of, Quebec, invasion of Quebec was in 1775. What the fuck? I don't need down through upstate uh, it's very confusing the for invasion me. of quebec uh first major military initiative by the newly formed continental army during the american revolutionary war okay so yeah there we go we're just kind of stupid when it comes to history clearly uh -huh. <laughs> yeah thank god so they're going north is that the thing i mean it's gilead uh, invading well, or well i mean they're going down i mean they're going south obviously i think for, for if they're going down through upstate new york it's basically, yeah, they're the American revolutionaries that are going to come down and uh, overthrow Gilead, at least go for it anyways. Oh, okay, uh, right. The objective of the campaign was to gain military control of the British province of Quebec, modern-day Canada, and French-speaking Canadians to join the revolution on the side of the 13 colonies. Oh, and Natasha in the chat says that she, uh, the person in the uh, apartment, was with Luke in that group that helped him escape into Canada. And oh, she was also a handmaid at some point. Yeah, now I remember that. I remember that. I apologize. It's been a bit since season one. I did think she looked familiar. That's why I've, I've, um, I assumed we'd seen her before, but I couldn't place it. But yeah, when that's that whole sequence when they're making the getaway. Yes. Uh, but that is, I mean, that's the main, I guess we've gone through most of the points of the episode because we don't see that much of... Uh, Luke, it's kind of at the start there, and then the club scene later, and the holy fruit loops, uh, or yeah, <laughs> blessed be the fruit yeah, loops. Blessed be the fruit loops. Exactly. Uh, so yeah, yeah. So I mean, back to well, the, one other thing too that I thought I'd be, I guess it's not on the nose, but I guess it ties into what you were talking about last week when we see June set up her memorial and uh, say a prayer. Mm -hmm. And then in this week, we find out that our savior guy is uh, is Muslim, and he has to hide that. And again, Which, well, go ahead. I was going to say, did it make you think of V for Vendetta? Because it made me think of V for Vendetta because she's also under the bed, which is what happens when they bust in and, and cap Stephen Fry uh, for uh, keeping a Quran and a bunch of other paraphernalia around. And they're under the bed there, and she's under the bed. It's just uh, kind of a, a surface similarity, but uh, still kind of similar. I don't, yeah, I don't remember either. I, I, well, I don't remember the V for Vendetta. I saw it once. Yeah, um, well, I watched it a lot of times. Um, well, I was just going to say, be, because it's like, I don't know if maybe there's some weird initiative of the show to try to distance themselves from religion to be like, because, I mean, the common uh, cry of like this show of like, you know, you religious people, they're going to put us in the handmaid's tale in real life. Yeah. And, and I think Margaret Atwood said that, like, it's not supposed to be about religion. Like, that's not what they mean necessarily, even though clearly, like, it's a big part of this culture that we're seeing on the show. Yeah, but, I, I think that's fair. It's just, it, it, I can't relate to then like, okay, I'm going to find solace with my God, like at least for, um, at least for June, because it's not like we saw her ever caring about religion in the past. But yeah. uh, I guess she's rejecting their perversion of her, uh, I don't know, her religion. Well, it's just, uh, yeah, I mean, I guess it's either way, because I mean, either religion that we've seen reference this season could both uh, track towards a handmaid's tale type living. So 
Um, it is interesting that they're trying to call out like the, I guess, not all, maybe a hashtag, not all religions they're doing. I don't know. And I get yeah. the other common criticism just in a meta sense from like the real world is that, uh, uh, what's the actress name that plays June? Elizabeth Moss. She's a Scientologist and yeah. there's a lot of, there's a lot of weird fucking creepy shit going on there. And especially like the way they take advantage of women as well. So, I mean, definitely some hypocritical things going on. I don't know if that's related or not, but would it have been great if she instead sat down and said a little prayer to the space ghosts and the Thetan levels and all that, instead of to the Holy ghosts? Probably uh, that could help. It's just weird. Cause like, you know, if you take that in or, into respect or, um, or Christianity or Islam, you can kind of take pieces of all three and you get yourself uh, Gilead. So there you go. Yes. Um, and we forgot about the most important scene where uh, she sings Hollaback Girl with her mom in a car. <laughs> that was my <laughs> other question I was going to ask. Like, how far into the future is it again? I had the same thought of like, whoa, like maybe she grew up with Hollaback Girl and that's yeah. like her Nat King Cole. <laughs> like, like kind of in Westworld of how Westworld's supposed to be, you know, 30 uh like 30 plus years in the future so they could bump kanye as an old man and be like yeah this is like back in my day uh i was almost wondering that with june's mom if it's just like this is a classic from when i came up holla back girl yes put it on the oldies channel june and it ain't no holla back girl yeah i can see it um it's clearly not that far in the future. I mean, it's almost like in the present. They're almost making the point of like, we're like max five years. So she's probably just a hip mom, probably. Mm. But uh, there's that aspect as well. And and they get to do this thing where they p put in some pop music, but they don't have to have it like blasting at you, which I kind of appreciate for a change. They have some other, they, they actually have other like musical elements on top well, of it. And it's just I in the background. To... Yeah, you had to you had to kind of listen hard. I bet you a lot of people wouldn't have picked up that it's Holla Back Girl at first. So you got to kind of listen, and they blend it a bit. And it's mostly because you see them singing like, "That's my shit, that's my shit." <laughs> oh yeah, well you you gotta have the I had the subtitles, so I saw the whole fucking verse, or yeah, the whole chorus, all of it. Bananas, man. Um, but yeah, then she's in the plane, and we think it's all gonna be happy ending unless we've read any reviews, and then uh, then we're fucked. Yeah, I still, I there was still a part of me. I was like, they're gonna get away. That stupid mm -hmm. guy got shot, but he's gonna take off and fly away. But nope, fucking uh, pilot gets shot in the head. The fucking guy gets dragged out. She gets fucking dragged out of the plane, and we're back. We're back in Gilead. You can't. You can take the girl out of Gilead, but nope, no, you can't. She ain't going. <laughs> yeah, very true. Um, I, I mean, they did. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off, but uh, right. like we we talked about last week, that it was refreshing to kind of see things change up a bit, mm -hmm. and from uh from that like a just a pure like meta narrative standpoint, it's disappointing because it's like, uh, I don't want to be like in this like torture of Gilead again, but also just from a storyline character dramatic standpoint, it's just heartbreaking because she was so close to getting away. But it's like, yeah, no, she can't get away because we, we haven't seen the last of the commander. And um, what's the other? Uh, uh, Serena. Serena. And yeah. she's pregnant. So ugh, it, 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 I mean, I'm glad it wasn't spoiled for me because I totally thought she was uh, a gonzo and it was all going to be about her trying to get back to get her child. Um, yeah. It's uh, devastating. Just movement wise, I'm worried that the next episode it's gonna feel like, oh cool, season one again. Like yeah. we're just back to this, or yeah, it's gonna be like even more extreme punishment because you tried to run away, or or probably they'll do some twist on that because they have sort of laid it on thick that if you misbehave, you get chained to a bed or whatever. And if the next episode is her chained to a bed, I'd be rather surprised. I feel more like, I don't know, the com commander is gonna say something or do something, and it's not gonna be exactly like that. And as you said, we haven't. We haven't had a lot of interaction with the commander and Serena, and they're both good actors and they're good characters as well that have a bit more to bring to this. At the same time, not just for June's sake and not just in a selfish sense, but in a story way, I am concerned that, okay, now more of this. Like, is it just, are there really just two modes of like enslavement and uh, did you get away or not? Like, 
I guess it, I wouldn't have preferred it if they spent five episodes doing the motion, motion that happens in this one episode. It's just as long as we don't get three more episodes of her being a handmaid and doing handmade stuff. Yeah, I, no, I totally agree with that. And um, I mean, uh, I, I don't think this isn't really a spoiler, but I, I have heard people have said like this show seems to open up to be more of a ensemble now. And I mean, I haven't okay. quite seen that yet, but I don't know. Like, I don't know. People are just talking out of their ass, but they've, I've heard it uh, mentioned in similar fashion to orange is the new black, which started out with like Piper as the main character. And now it's more so about the ensemble. Mm -hmm. So maybe when we do get back to, you know, Gilead with the handmaids, it's going to open that up and we're going to explore some of those characters a bit more, or we'll be spending more time, in the colonies with Emily and her crew, I guess we'll see. Uh, yeah, that, yeah. That, that's what I was thinking that we kind of saw that in episode two. Yes. Yeah. I've just, uh, I am, I am like you, like from a narrative standpoint, I'm worried that it, it, it be season one. And yeah, she's just kind of sprawled out on the floor, looking at the wall again and trying to figure out where to go from here. Yeah. Adding more carvings to the wall and writing more letters and like, Oh yeah, you did the May day thing. So that's over. like, they're not going to, Pr probably let her like do more rebellion stuff uh because she's caught now again so it's kind of how do you build that tension again it makes sense if they start like if the next episode is 80 percent canada or whatever uh that wouldn't necessarily be bad because we could get some momentum going in those other storylines of like no we're going down to save her and we could get the same sort of feeling as if june was there trying to save hannah except it's them planning how to save june and hannah or uh, things along those lines, and also the colonies, etc. There's a lot of space to explore in this show, which is why it's very good that they made a second season and uh, didn't just go, oh, yeah, that's the book. There we go. Yeah, yeah. I'm uh, looking forward to some, to see where it goes and some new episodes. I'm in. I mean, I, like I said, I do think, I think it's a well-made show, and I like that it's not easy to keep this tone, and they have enough, they play around with it enough here and there to kind of keep you invested. And I mean, I guess back to what we were talking about the end of last week, if we're going to get some more of those like, like, Holy shit, like fuck yeah moments, it, you know, it doesn't seem like we're going to get them anytime soon, but uh, I'm hoping for them. <laughs> yeah, that's true. We'll get some small ones, maybe some people tied to crosses like last time. Uh, who knows? But that does about wrap up episode three. Uh, if you like to would like to include uh, your opinions on the show, you can um, send them to showswhatyouknowshow at gmail.com and we'll include your questions, thoughts, and theories in our next discussion. We are doing these live on our YouTube. That is youtube.com slash showswhatyouknow. Or you can just find it on the podcast feed for Gilead Gazette. Uh, and if you do that, please consider leaving a review because it's a new feed and getting some reviews in early is uh, really going to help maybe get some more ears uh, listening to these dulcet old tones. Absolutely. I'm, I'm all for it. And of course, we also have uh, a show on Westworld called Westworld Theories. And we have a show going through the Sopranos called Cut to Black Sopranos Sit Down. So all kinds of great stuff from us, your heroes. Uh, and uh, you can find more of Jacob at awesomepedia.org, and you can find more from me at jimandthem.com. Yeah, I just, there's just one thing left to say, I feel. Wait, what's that? Stop the presses! <laughs> <laughs>